Okay, right. I do believe we are ready to start today's webinar. So let me click to the first slide. I hope everybody can hear me and I hope everybody can see the slides moving and there's a little red dot on the screen. So uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Stefan Shaborski. I'm the CSO and founder of Reinnovate Limited. Just by way of background, uh, I'm a cell biologist by training and I've been working with cell culture methods for uh, many, many years. And early work in the uh, about 15 years or so ago uh, led me to the conclusion that I needed to improve the way in which I was working with cells in culture, which led to the development of Alvatex technology, which I'm going to talk to you about today. So Today's uh, title is Building Better Cell-Based Assays Using 3D Cell Culture, Demonstration of Versatility and Compatibility of Alpha Text. So I'll give you an introduction to what the technology is about and explain clearly uh, its attributes and why it was developed, and then run for a series of example uh, applications, not in especially any detail, but it will give you a good flavor of what uh, Alvatec technology can do. Uh, we also run other webinars where we go into much more depth, so it's a particular subject that you're interested in, uh, look out for those additional webinars. And then I will finish off today's presentation by going over some of the methods and analytical techniques which are compatible with this technology. Okay, so if we uh, look at this first slide, we see the in vivo situation across the top. And this is a histological image of real tissue in the body. And we can show that schematically here and a single cell here. And a cell resides with other cells and the extracellular matrix. And that's a complex three-dimensional system. But in vitro, we disrupt these relationships between cells. And cells come into contact more often than not with a flat, planar two-dimensional substrate, most often made of polystyrene, or it can be glass as well. And when cells come into contact with that flat surface, they change their shape and modify their structural phenotype. And inside the cell, there is remodeling of organelles, cytoskeleton, and other major components. And as a consequence, the cell responds it alters its gene expression profile, protein translation, and ultimately function. So studying cells when they're flattened like this are quite different to how they are in three dimensions and certainly different to how they are in vivo. If we look a little more closely about cells in 2D, in a monolayer within a flask or a petri dish, cells grow as these flat uniform layers Half of the cell almost is against the substrate. The other half mostly against the medium. The cells are flattened, and the interaction between adjacent cells is minimized. And of course, we cannot create complex relationships like we can in vivo. So the substrate upon which a cell grows will play an important role in determining the shape and form of the cell. And we can see that clearly here. So this is a fibroblast, which has been stained with phylloidin. So that's labeling the S-actin, uh, cytoskeleton component. And we are visualizing that on a confocal. So it's a single cell visualized from above or from the side. And you can see how flattened that cell has become. Whereas if you visualize the cell in three dimensions using confocal, you'll see that when it's grown on Albatex, our product, the cell has this uh, three-dimensional structure. And the same applies to uh, organelles, major organelles within the cell. This is the nucleus, and you see how flattened it has become in 2D culture, where it remains spherical in 3D. And this is nothing especially very new. It is well known that cells uh, change shape, and alteration of shape will affect transcription, as it says here, and of course, as well, there are other examples. And there are many examples of papers published in the scientific literature, which will show that. So there's a demand, therefore, for growing cells 
in cell culture in three dimensions. So the 2D environment is synthetic and far removed, as we've just described. It is also recognized in the literature that growth in 3D is different to 2D. And then that there is now also evidence in the literature of structural and functional superiority of cells growing in 3D compared to 2D. And all of this is building building up to lead to the demand for technologies that enable you now to grow cells routinely in 3D in the cell culture lab. So therefore imagine a simple and routine solution to 3D cell culture, and this is what we're all about. So we are trying to recreate a natural three-dimensional environment for cell growth to occur, to enable cells to acquire a structure which is more like what they acquire in vivo. So you're getting closer to the in vivo situation. And this will enable cells to uh, have increased viability, functionality, and more representative of the real tissue that they represent. So let me take you through a few steps which led to the development of the technology that uh, We've, uh, we sell today, which is known as Albatex. So our aim at the onset was to produce a scaffold for routine 3D culture which has these attributes. It must have a reproducible and consistent structure. It is inert and does not degrade and remains stable during storage, transportation, and during the actual use and experiment. And that's important. Biodegradable uh, technologies will change, of course, during an experiment and also release local products and alter the pH, for example, and that will affect cell behavior and is an added variable. This is not the case with the technology that we have developed. The material that our technology is made from is the same as existing two-dimensional products, so it's made of polystyrene. It's adaptable to existing cell culture formats, and it's developed as a consumable product. So if you think about uh, currently how cell culture is practiced, a flask, multiple plate, or petri dish is brought in, stored on the shelf, and then used, and then disposed of. And that's conventional 2D culture. What we're trying to do is produce a technology that works in the same way and enables you to practice 3D culture. And we've achieved this with our text, and that's what I'm going to introduce to you today. The other important point is, is that the material is the same, polystyrene, as I already mentioned. And that is an important factor, because when you are studying the effect of growing cells in three dimensions, you can run 2D versus 3D comparisons directly. The material is the same. The only thing that has changed is the third dimension. And importantly, the product becomes sterile, prefabricated, ready to use, just like standard uh, cell culture plate, flask, or dish. So let's introduce this technology. It's called Alvatex Scaffold. So in this uh, diagram here, we have the 2D situation, so cells growing as monolayers. You can see that quite clearly. And they're the polystyrene dishes in this case. Now here is the polystyrene scaffold in the 3D situation. We've introduced now the z-axis. So this enables cells to go into this scaffold material, into that matrix, and populate that space, and then pile up on top of each other. They don't, don't spread out now, and they create three-dimensional structures. So Alvatex is 90% porous. That means 90% of that uh, volume, if you like, is space, 10% being plastic. The scaffold has been engineered into a membrane. It's 200 microns thick, so you can see that here and here in cross-section. And cells will go into this material, and they will form uh, 3D and DVO-like structures. So you can see this histology image here. This scaffold has been populated with cells. And now we are seeing, we can't actually see the structure of the scaffold itself. We see a slab of tissue-like material. And that's what we're trying to achieve with our technology. It's only 200 microns thick, remember. 
It's not necessary actually to fill the entire scaffold. 3D culture can be achieved just in the top layers as well, as I will show. So these are the products which are currently available. We have a plate format and an insert format. So we have 12, 24, and 96 well plates, as shown across the top. Uh, 3x4 well is also coming uh, later, and it's under development. We also have the 6 and uh, 12 well inserts. And they're very, very important because we spent a lot of time studying how the presentation of the scaffold is important. And that's what also sets our society. We put a lot of uh, effort into understanding uh, how the technology works. And not only does it enable us to optimize technology, but it also creates new opportunities and demonstrates versatility and flexibility. So in example A, for example, we've got the scaffold within the well of the multi-well plate. It's located on the base of the well. So cells will come in from the top and you'll only feed from above. Whereas in B, this is the well insert, the scaffold with the cells in 3D culture is suspended and the cells can receive nutrition and oxygen from above and below. So that's the standard sort of uh, setup you would get with a trans well. But this time, of course, we have Instead of a porous membrane, we have Alvatex 3D scaffold in here. And in C, this is another insert here, exactly the same as this example in D. But what we've got here is a much larger reservoir of medium. So this is this device down here. So this is a Petri dish and a cradle. And within the cradle are three well inserts. And we can fill this Petri dish up with 90 mils of media, and that enables you to do much longer experiments without disturbing or changing the medium regularly. It enables you to do conditioned media studies if you wish, and you can also put different cell culture, cell types rather, in each of these inserts and see how they signal to each other through parapine factors. So it's a very versatile technology. And the next slide demonstrates that further, showing how it can be used for co-culture. So this is a, uh, a, a set of figures which have come out of our general brochure showing different scenarios. So in number one, we've got two cell types mixed and seeded simultaneously into the Alvatex scaffolds in 3D, either in a plate or well insert. Here we've got 3D in the insert and 2D on the base of a conventional plate. So again, you can have signaling between the two cell populations, or you can have 3D, 3D, and signaling as shown in scenario three. In four, you can have 3D and 3D together. So you can put two disks of Alvatex together if you wish and study signaling. We can recreate layers of uh, different cell types to try and resemble layers within organ structure. And I'll show you examples of uh, these various scenarios uh, as we go through this presentation. So not only have we been very careful about the development of this technology, we've spent a lot of time working ourselves, but also with our collaborators and customers to demonstrate how it can be used. And we demonstrated this in a wide range of applications. So we've got good evidence of how structure and function of cells can be uh, altered in 3D, the growth and differentiation, we can develop uh, novel assays and in vitro models, and we can create quite complex structures in vitro using this technology. So we can study tissue development and organization of tissues in the laboratory. So I'm going to run now through a series of examples. So the first one is liver hepatocytes, and this is just a snapshot of some data we have showing how their structure function is altered. So in this slide, we have here uh, primary hepatocytes, which have been grown uh, in 2D and 3D culture. The cells have been labeled with a fluorescent dye and imaged under the confocal microscope. 
So you see how flattened they become in 2D, whereas in 3D they retain their cuboidal form. And we've seeded the cells at low density so you can see the outline of the cells. Right? So if you see them at higher densities, you'll see you get this three-dimensional structure on the top of the scaffold. This is HEP-G2, so this is histology, the uh, apicarcinoma cells inside the Albertex. This is scanning electron microscopy, so you're now looking in to the material, seeing the cells in 3D, note the microvilli on the surface. Where cells come together, they form tight junctions, and in between, sometimes they will form a biocannuliculus. And we can identify their structures using antibodies to uh, apical membrane proteins, such as the p glycoprotein here. You'll see that structure, that pink structure there, is the bark and aliculus. We also incidentally publish a lot of uh, our work, uh, but now we're getting many more publications through uh, independent studies from our customers who bought the product, used it in their laboratory, and they're publishing in scientific journals. The one uh, thing we observed in a short-term experiment was when uh, we were using the primary hepatocytes was that they uh, showed enhanced cell viability uh, in 3D compared to 2D. This is a, a live uh, dead cell assay. And we're looking at different seeding densities here. See the proportion of live cells is greater in 3D compared uh, to 2D. That's important if you're using the primary hepatocytes because uh, they're expensive to work with. And there's also a limited time frame which you can use them in the laboratory. We've also got uh, good data showing uh, the difference in the function between uh, cells growing in two dimensions and three dimensions. So this is looking at CYP450 enzyme expression. Uh, when the cells have been challenged with uh, a toxin. And we see the induction levels are greater in 3D for various SIPs uh, compared to 2D. So 3D being the black bars, 2D being the gray bars. Just one point, it, it doesn't always work that way. Um, sometimes you see lower responses in 3D compared to 2D, and that's comforting in many respects, because if everything always went up, higher in 3D than 2D, one would be quite suspicious that it was an artifact of their growth. But we also get changes occurring in both directions. We also get situations where there's no difference as well. This is a, a collaboration uh, between Reinnovate and Metasite. Metasite is a uh, company based in Germany, which has developed technology called Upsite, and that enables uh, hepatocytes and other cells to continue to proliferate for up to 40 population doubling. So Metasite are very interested now in taking their technology and applying it to a 3D platform. And that's what we've done in this experiment. And I just wanted to point out that actually, uh, not only did they get, uh, in this case for SIP3A4, uh, higher levels of activity in 3D compared to 2D, but also uh, there was an enhanced effect when co-cultured with endothelial cells. So the mixture of the two cell types then growing in 3D also made a significant difference. And we're developing this work further with the team in medicine. So let's move on to a different uh, model, which is uh, one of uh, neural development. So we have a long-standing interest of working uh, with stem cells and differentiating them into neurons. And we do that using uh, now a standard operating procedure. And we generate neurospheres. And we can plate them out onto 2D plastic, and they'll radiate their neurites, as shown here. But in these experiments, we've been plating them onto Albertext. So we take these sorts of structure, and then we place them on the surface of the scaffold. Unfortunately, these arrows are the wrong way around, so ignore those there. But the arrows indicate the neurites going into the fabric of the scaffold. So you can see uh, in these images underneath uh, cells which have been grown. So a neurosphere which has been grown on the surface of Albertex. The surface is shown by this dotted line here. Here are the cells, and 
the neurites are shown in green. This is uh, TUJ1 staining for neurites. So you can visualize these structures uh, from the side. Okay, so you're looking transversely into the scaffold that's been sectioned, or you can visualize from above, or you can visualize from underneath the scaffold. So these are neurites which have journeyed 200 microns through the polystyrene scaffold from the cells above. Okay, that's what you're seeing there. So we've, we're using this system to develop a, uh, a 3D neurite outgrowth model. And we have another webinar scheduled uh, later this year to discuss that in more depth. What we can also do is we can uh, use the attributes of our text scaffold and we can firstly populate it with another cell type. In the brain, of course, neurons interact very closely with uh, the glia, and the glia are composed of uh, numerous cell types, including uh, the astrocytes and the astroglial cells. So we can uh, develop models to simulate the interaction between these two cell types in 3D. So what we've got in this example this is the Alvatex scaffold here. We first of all cultured inside the scaffold uh, an example of an atroglial cell, a U118 uh, cell line, and then we put onto the surface of the scaffold after the U118 cells are established, one of the neurospheres, and then we can study how the neurites grow and interact. So in the control, Okay, it's black around the neurosphere, so there are no, okay, in this case, there are no glial cells. Here are the glial cells, u 118 and this is the human neurosphere. And notice now that the neurites wrap around the neurosphere. They don't go into the material or out of the material because they're inhibited by the glial cells. Now, if we visualize this uh, from underneath in the control, the neurites go all the way through as before. No evidence of neurites in the co culture with glia. No evidence of green staining here. The, the uh, blue nuclei there are the DAPI stain nuclei of the atroglial cells. But what we can do then is look at uh, small molecules which interact with the molecular mechanisms which control neurite inhibition. And this is useful when studying the glial scar which forms during spinal cord injury. So we can use this model to mimic this process and it's useful for investigators interested in developing small molecules to overcome neurite inhibition. So this molecule here is a ROC inhibitor and it's well known to play a role in this mechanism. So if we add this small molecule to our co-culture, we find now we have neurites coming through uh, and being expressed on the bottom of the scaffold. And we can quantify the number of neurites and we can measure their lengths and so forth using image analysis packages. And you can see very nicely how you get that uh, rescue effect when adding the rock inhibitor. This is a different example. This is uh, mesenchymal tissues. So what we have here are primary mesenchymal cells from adult rats. So these are multipotent cells. We're growing them here in 2D and we characterize them to make sure that they are what they are by expressing these surface markers. And we can induce them either to make bone or fat. And that's a standard protocol which is performed in 2D culture. We've now adapted that for 3D culture using Albatex. So we have here a histological image of the mesenchymal stem cells within the scaffold. And what we also find is these cells uh, deposit lots of extracellular matrix within the material, certainly collagen. So we've got here an MTT uh, cell viability assay showing a linear growth curve within the material in 3D. And panel B, I'll come on to this again later. This is a, you're looking into a well here, a 12 well plate, and this is a disc of Alvatex, and it's been stained 
with uh, neutral red, which is the cell viability dye, which shows not only the distribution of the cells, grossly and simply in the culture, but it gives you an idea of their viability. So once these cells are growing and differentiating, in this case into bone, one can use various assays. And these are simple, straightforward commercial kits, but alkaline phosphatase, osteocalcin, serious red and omazarin red. And osteocalcin deposition is indicative of bone formation. So is alkaline phosphatase. And we're getting uh, collagen formation here, less collagen in, in 3D here than 2D because these guys are making bone in this case. And alazarin is showing us calcium deposition, which is higher in uh, 3D. You can actually see the cells in these internal stem cells uh, making bone and de depositing collagen by performing various methods. So these are uh, SEM images showing the cells within the material. So these whiter areas here. This is our text, the gray ghosts of the cells. This is a bone nodule here. This is bone cossa staining. And we perform some uh, trichrome staining here to show collagen. You just see empty areas of our text here, but lots of deposition here. So you can see very clear differences. So our text can also be used uh, as a platform for cell cytotoxicity, particularly in the cancer area. So this is very useful for uh, screening uh, drug, drug candidates, uh, which could potentially be used for uh, anti-cancer reagents. So here's a, an example. Uh, this is uh, NCF7, so this is a well-known breast tumor lineage. And we have a nice example here of a linear growth curve. Notice, though, it starts to plateau after about to three weeks. So essentially, it's beginning to reach confluency in 3D culture. So the linear sector is this seven to 14 day part here, or probably three to 14 days. This is done by uh, NTT, but there are other cell viability assays you can use. And on our website, we have protocols for NTT, NTS, LMR Blue Cell Titer Glow is a, is a new one which is developed by uh, Promega, which uh, we're also currently using. I'll come on to that again in a moment. So let's look uh, more closely at the growth of these NCF7 cells. So here they are in 2D conventional copter, and here they are in a xenograft. So they've been put into an animal, creating this tumor like structure. And we're positioning Albatex technology in between the two, and the cells growing in 3D, we propose are closer to the animal situation here than the monolayer situation. And the problems that the monolayers have, as I described at the beginning of this presentation. So we create these 3D cultures uh, in Albatex, and then we can treat those cultures with various drugs. This is tamoxifen. So we've only allowed the culture to grow for three days before we add different concentrations of drug. You can see that they begin to knock down the cells, and we can calculate uh, IC50 values uh, from these cultures just as normal. And they are different, as you can see, between the two culture systems. That, that earlier work I just showed you was performed in um, 12 well plates and well inserts, but we are now uh, working with other companies to develop uh, higher throughput assay uh, systems. And this represents an example. So we are partnering with Oncotest in Germany. Uh, TCAN, many of you will have heard of TCAN, they are experts in automation and liquid handling and automated cell culture is achievable as well. Um, the company Promega produces commercial uh, kits for cell molecular biology, and we're introducing the 3D touch technology. So what we are doing essentially is within these 96 wall plates on a robotics platform, we are testing various cells produced by OncTest 
uh, in these plates, we're testing compounds on them and using the Promega cell cytoglow assay to look at the uh, cytotoxicity of these cells in response to those compounds. So these are uh, cell cells generated by Oncotest here and here, and they have been exposed to various types of drugs. So uh, here, here, and here are examples, and we have these nice kill curves, very tight error bars as well, showing that on the 96 well Alvatex plate, you can indeed get uh, these readouts as one would expect from a 96 well plate approach. But this time, of course, uh, they are, the cells are growing in three dimensions. And this was, uh, as I say, done in collaboration with Oncotest in particular. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Samir Dar. Now, the other advantage of doing this is that uh, we can also perform uh, multiplexing uh, in Alvatex. So here's an example. This is a, uh, a kill curve, once again, uh, for uh, two different drugs, uh, either in isolation or in combination. We've then got subsequent uh, to the experiment isolation of protein and Western analysis. So the important thing to point out is that at these three different concentrations, uh, notice there's no difference in cell viability. But if you take then protein from each of those three different uh, uh, cultures and then run it out on a Western and probe for phosphorylated CMET, you actually do begin to see that there are differences in protein expression before a difference observed in cell viability that you get at higher drug concentration. So the ability to do multiplexing with Alvatex technology is a distinct advantage, especially over soft AVR approaches. And that's made very easy to get RNA and protein out of these plates. So let's look at a more complex uh, model. And the last two examples are more complex. So this first one is skin. So We've been partnering with a number of uh, uh, groups which have expertise in the growth of primary skin uh, in, in Europe. And here we have uh, two examples at the bottom. So these are both co-cultures with uh, primary dermal cells inside Alvatex here and here, and then primary keratinocytes grown at the edict interface above. And then we have stratification of, and formation of the stratum corneum at the air liquid interface. And the actual production of these corneocytes, as they're known, is actually quite difficult to achieve in culture, and that was uh, the goal of doing this. These are examples of uh, electron micrographs of these surface cells. This is the scaffold. You can see the layering of the cells on the top as well. So you can also uh, perform transmission electron microscopy to look at these uh, tissues. Uh, so this is TEM uh, micrographs showing uh, tight junctions between cells. Here's a nice example, cell here, cell here, nice tight junction. There's a zone. These are keratin uh, bundles within the cells. Lots of information can be uh, acquired from the structure of the cells using this technology. You can also perform immunocytochemistry to look at the regulation of the various proteins as the cells differentiate towards the surface of the skin and the immature and mature markers within the model are the right way round. You'd expect the immature markers at the bottom and the mature markers at the top. Uh, and that's exactly what we see. And we can also prepare cornified envelopes um, from uh, the skin model. So this is a, an example using uh, cell line and the stack app. So these are human keratinocytes, and they rarely produce uh, cornified envelopes. We don't see very much evidence at all in uh, 2D culture. These are cornified envelopes in uh, preparations isolated from real skin, from the mouse in this case. And where you make these uh, uh, samples is that you boil the preparation, the skin sample, in SDS, and then you stain with a lipophilic dye, fluorescent dye, uh, 
to identify the remnants of the cell. And we can see these structures here in real skin. We also get them in our 3D model as well, which is evidence of uh, differentiation towards the stratum corneum and the cornified envelope. Okay, so the last uh, I'm a model I want to show is another co co-culture system. So epithelia, by their very nature, especially simple epithelia, are two-dimensional structures, monolayers of cells, and they grow upon the basement membrane. So Arbitex scaffold, by its nature, is not ideal to grow, of course, a, uh, a monolayer of cells within the medium. But we can use the scaffold still to achieve this objective. And what we do is we take uh, uh, extracellular matrix proteins and we coat the surface of the gel very, of the uh, scaffold with a very thin layer of gel. You can see that by electron microscopy here or by staining. Okay, so it's all lit up here above the scaffold. High magnification, so you can see the gel. And then on the surface, one can see a monolayer of uh, your epithelial cells of choice. And in this example, we have used uh, the popular CACO2 uh, colonic cell line. We can characterize those cells. We can show that they polarize. So the surface of the cells have the microvilli. You can see them here, here very clearly. Uh, the, the, around the top of the cell are tight junctions. You can see them with the microvilli. And you can stain for them using uh, occludin. So you've got a ring of occludin staining around the top of the cell. You can see that by topocal on the bottom there in the transverse section as well. So they're doing what they're supposed to be doing um, on top of this uh, collagen gel on top of Albatex scaffold. Now, there are various reasons why you would want to do that on Albatex. Uh, one is because uh, you've got greater porosity. Remember, Albatex is 90% porous, so you've got an excellent uh, ability to feed that uh, epithelium from beneath. But also, the other advantage is actually to put an additional cell type into the scaffold beneath the epithelium to create a lamina propria. And collectively, with the epithelium, the basement membrane equivalent, the gel layer, and the cells within the scaffold, you can create a mucosa. And that's what we're doing. So this is an example where we have an Arbitex scaffold. Inside we've got fibroblasts. You can see them here. And these are fibroblasts in this case, which has been derived from colon. So they match to the epithelial uh, uh, cell type CACO2 as best as possible. Uh, and then this is the gel layer here. So we have a mucosa-like system and of course, if one were to develop that within a well insert, one could think about using it uh, to study the interaction between uh, the fibroblasts and the epithelial cells. That's important. There's evidence to show that those, those signaling events control proliferation and differentiation. But also the transport of uh, materials across that epithelium. Okay, so to finish off, I just want to mention a few new technologies that we're developing at the moment. Um, one is how to work with primary tissues. So when you are presented with a sample of primary tissue, uh, it's possible to place that on the surface of an empty scaffold. And depending upon the tissue and the cells it contains, uh, cells can grow from the explant into the scaffold. That has the advantage that those cells inside the scaffold now, which can be maintained in 3D pasta, have never come into contact with a two-dimensional uh, surface. That might be of interest to some of you. Um, you can also use uh, Arbitex products uh, to maintain uh, pieces of tissue uh, in culture. So more recently, uh, we've developed a new form of uh, Albatex called Albatex Strata. It's the same principle, but it just has a smaller void size. 
So Albatex scaffold voids are about 40 microns in diameter. Strata voids are about 15. So the cells tend to stay mostly on the surface, but it does depend on the cell type. Some will go inside. So here what we've got, we're maintaining uh, embryoid bodies derived from human embryonic stem cells uh, in culture, and they're differentiating, and then we are staining them with three different uh, markers indicative of the germ layers. So potentially you could use that as an alternative approach to a teratoma apple. We can also uh, use this material to maintain tissue slices. So here's an example from neuroscience. So brain or spinal cord slice here on top of a slice of Alphex uh, material. So here we've got this uh, insert with Alphatex strata inside. This is the objective lens. And the beauty of doing this is, is that the brain slice over a experimental period, of this case uh, 24 hours, does not move during the experiment. So if you're doing a live cell imaging experiment where you're recording the migration of cells, you've not only got advantages of enhanced cell viability because of feeding from underneath, but also the actual tissue slice doesn't slip across the, uh, the, the surface. Uh, and that's exactly what happens with uh, uh, existing porous membranes. So this brain slice, or spinal cord slice in this case, has slipped 405 microns over 24 hours. Uh, so if you're looking for cells moving, you've not only got the cells moving inside the slice, but the slice is well moving. So we can stop that from happening, pretty much. Uh, lastly, here's an example of seeding uh, primary neurons uh, from embryonic tissues uh, directly into the Arctic scaffold to them growing aggregates and creating lots of neural connections within them. And that work was done in collaboration with uh, Reading as a set of the bottom. And just to introduce another new technology, the last one I'm going to mention, uh, and that is uh, we're also uh, working on a perfusion system whereby uh, we can also circulate medium through a plate and enable dynamic feeding of three-dimensional cultures. So this is a, it looks like a standard uh, six well plate. This is actually a prototype here, which you're looking at. These uh, four wells are connected, so it's a circuit of medium, which is pumped. You can see the pump here. And these are the inserts containing other texts and the medium goes around and comes out. But it enables you to continually circulate the medium, so you have a unidirectional flow, so you have different cell types represented, so they can signal downstream uh, to one another, just like what organ systems do in the body connected by the vasculature. And dynamic flow it does make a difference. Uh, there's evidence to show that it can have an effect. OK, so just to finish off, let's go through some methods which are compatible with our text. So uh, to visualize cells in the material, it's challenging using a standard uh, inverted phase microscope, which we would normally use in the cell culture lab. But you can use that microscope if you stain the cells first with neutral red. So we have a very simple protocol. We add this very simple uh, inexpensive dye to the culture, and you can see the cells now lighting up. And you can get an idea of gross distribution at low magnification, but you can also see the cells individually as well if you need to. And that's only something that you need to do at the beginning if you so wish to see the cells once you've optimized the system. Histology is uh, achievable using this technology. So let's not forget we are creating tissue-like structures inside uh, the scaffold. You can release the disc very easily from the insert. It's designed to uh, unclip to release the membrane. And you can see this culture here has been stained with buins, which is a yellow-based fixative, over 4 to 21 days. So the cultures are three weeks old. And you can see the intensity of staining increasing as the number of cells uh, begins to form and increase. They are then embedded 
into uh, paraffin wax blocks, just like you do tissue. You can then section them on a microtome, write them onto microscope slides and stain them. So this is uh, a slide showing an increasing 3D culture. You can see it with the naked eye. And under the microscope, you can actually see the detail. So once you've got sections, you can then perform things like immuno uh, cytochemistry. So here's an example here. And if your antibody doesn't like paraffin and paraffin you can also perform cryosectioning and immuno cytochemistry as well without the test. I've already mentioned confocal. So here are some more examples uh, on the left. This is some data from a customer in Glasgow using Confocal, and Patricia was uh, using Confocal to look at the migration of uh, cells into the material from the top surface at zero right into up to 90 micrometers. And in her experiment, she had a mutant uh, protein expressed in one particular cell type compared to control, and she showed very nicely how these cells migrated much more so than these cells. So you can use Confocal to visualize directly without having to section, and you can also perform lifestyle imaging if your cells are carrying a fluorescent reporter. And that's described in our white paper, which is also available online. So I've mentioned uh, electron microscopy. Here's TEM, and this is SEM, again, protocols online. I think this example shows very nicely the complexity of a 3D tissue culture. Here's Albertex, just in pieces here and here. These are all cells, and you can see there that the surface are beginning to uh, begin to stratify in the skin model. Now remember that Albertex is made of polystyrene, so just like standard polystyrene, you can coat the plastic and you can use all these reagents which would be familiar to you when you're performing uh, 2D conventional culture. And we have protocols for all of these online. So here are some examples, collagen, fibronectin. The interesting thing about filamentous proteins though is that you get a three-dimensional web of the protein forming inside the material. And actually, this is much more realistic uh, way of presenting these proteins to the cells than a flat film, as they would experience in a monoculture situation. One layer, sorry. Um, there's also a reagent that we have uh, worked with Nurus, who developed a transfection uh, with, uh, reagents uh, in the US, and that's for transfecting cells in 3D. So visit their website and you'll see that reagent and you can use that with Albertex if you wish. And also we have lots of reference to other commercial kits uh, produced by various manufacturers which can be applied to Albertex and we have all the protocols online for the NTT, we have protocols for isolating gene and protein expression for uh, gene and protein and once that has been isolated, then you can perform your Westerns or your PCR, microarray, etc., uh, to do expression analyses. And all of that is also available uh, online as protocols. So, speaking about the online protocols, online technical support uh, available uh, on our website and also instructional videos. Okay, so to summarize, Albertex uh, is a uh, very versatile technology. It enables you now to grow cells and retain their natural three-dimensional shape and form. If you think about this technology in the most simple form, it is technology which prevents those cells from spreading out and adopting a flattened phenotype like they do in dimensional culture. So we've prevented that from happening, and we create these three-dimensional structures. And not only can we do that, we can put other cell types in the material to create co-cultures which more closely represent the structure of real tissue. So we've exemplified this technology uh, in collaboration with our uh, colleagues. We also have customers now publishing Frequently, and if you go onto our website, you'll 
see examples of papers from independent laboratories who have acquired the technology. If you visit our website at reinnovate.com, you'll find a lot of the information that I've spoken about today, and also you'll be able to uh, access those protocols, see all the publications which are associated with the technology and so forth. If you're interested in acquiring the technology, again, follow the uh, uh, product information uh, and links to our distributors. So I'll finish there, and I'll take any questions. So I've got some questions coming through using the chat box. So I've got a question here about uh, can objects use, be used for invasion assays? Um, uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, we have a, uh, a webinar next uh, month uh, about uh, cancer, and there is a part of that which is dedicated to development of a cell invasion assay. So if you're online, you'll find information about this as well. So it basically involves taking uh, stromal cells, growing them inside the alpha text, and then placing the cancer cells on top and studying the movement of those cells into and between the stromal cells as they, they would as it would happen in vivo. Okay, how thick is Alba text? Uh, 200 micrometers uh, thick, the membrane. Um, is it possible to retrieve cells from Alba text? Well, it, it is. Um, so I'll be totally honest with you. Uh, it is not possible to get 100% of your cells back from uh, the scaffold, uh, but there are many occasions where you don't actually need to get cells from the material. So if you think about total protein, uh, total RNA, or doing any of the sectioning techniques I mentioned, you don't have to get your cells out of the material at all. Uh, if you wish to, though, there is a protocol online, and it involves enzymatic methods and shaking, and you can get a proportion of your cells out of the material. It also depends on the nature of the cell type. So when you start growing cells in 3D, the cells tend to bind together really very thoroughly. And you need to start thinking about the methods that you use to break that tissue up normally. So for example, uh, with liver tissue, when we grow half hepatocytes, we would recommend using uh, collagenases and other methods that are used to actually break up liver tissue. Because now you've created a tissue-like three-dimensional structure in Alvatex, you need to think about those sorts of methods to break those cells up. So it is possible. But as I say, you're not going to get all the cells out. Okay. How long can you culture your cells in a 96 bar plate format while maintaining viability? Well, again, it depends on a number of things. Depends on uh, the cell type, number of cells you initially seed, uh, and the number of times you're going to change your medium. Now, this can all be done uh, automatically on a robotic platform if you have that capability. Um, we've taken uh, culture that two weeks uh, quite happily. Uh, I did show that cultures will reach competency in 3D. So that's something to consider as well. So just like a standard culture, once you've reached competency and cells continue to proliferate, then you can get overcrowding. And of course, you can then induce cell death in the process and so forth. So there are issues to look out for. Uh, I would always recommend that you perform uh, optimization, uh, first of all, do a nice uh, growth curve, get confident with the technology, uh, just using NTT in the first instance, very straightforward to achieve. Uh, and once you've got that confidence, you can then start to work with material specific to your needs. So have you tried to generate vessel-like structures from endothelial cells? Well, the nature of Alvatex scaffold and its structure is such that you won't necessarily get a vessel. Uh, so a vessel as in a cylinder-like structure, because the material is composed of uh, round voids. So that wouldn't be possible. However, 
in theory, you could paint the inside of the voids with endothelial cells. We have some uh, preliminary evidence that that is possible. So if you're interested in uh, thin sort of cells like that, it could be achievable, or you could grow them as a uh, thin uh, monolayer on a gel, as I showed you in that uh, epithelial system that I described. Okay, so no further questions at this time. Just like to thank you for your attention. And if you uh, can go to the website, you'll find lots of more information there as appropriate. And thank you very much for your attention.